Let me share my screen. Yeah. Today's talk is going to be on arthroscopic capsular release in one of the commonest condition that patients present with in the shoulder clinic, that is frozen shoulder. For the next 15 minutes, let me walk you across some of my tips and tricks that I feel it's useful in day-to-day -day practice of mine. I am Dr. Karthik Raj Kuberakani, arthroscopic shoulder and knee consultant practicing in Coimbatore. I would like to thank the Indian Arthroscopic Society for creating this excellent academic platform and giving me the opportunity to share my knowledge. Now it's interesting when we look these days comparing between the manipulation under anesthesia and capsular release. Now MUA is being treated as a barbaric procedure these days and arthroscopic capsular release is considered the procedure of choice in this era. Now is it true? It's a tricky question to answer. I would not coin the term barbaric because MUA has stood the time and it has always helped a number of orthopedic surgeons with this practice. Now, why has this comparison been like this? Let's look at the literature findings and why people have attributed so. Now, if you look here, the failure rate of manipulation under anesthesia, especially in uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, the famous study by Utz et al. have showed the failure rate to be as high as 40 to 50 percent. And what are the complications? Starting from iatrogenic proximal humeral fractures at around 10 percent, iatrogenic plexopathies being 2 percent, a rare but devastating one is post released instability, shoulder instability. Clubbing all this together, Manipulation anesthesia always tickles the mind to look for another procedure which could be more refined. Thereby, we arrive at the arthroscopic capsular release. Now, let me make it very clear this entire talk I am concentrating on capsular release, not for all kinds of stiff shoulder, <coughs> mind me, that is primary and secondary. We are looking at Oh, I'm going to be talking only for frozen shoulder. That is primary stiff shoulders without any identifiable cause. Not post-traumatic, not post-surgical, because these are different indications where the technical perspective and the cause varies a lot. Now, sticking to frozen shoulders, who are the ideal candidates? Now, patient selection in this category is really important. What I would like to emphasize is only one thing, be it MUA or arthroscopic capsular release, doesn't make a sense. As long as you're pulling the patient to the OR, it is going to be a final step after the treating doctors, treating physicians, all tools of conservative management, starting with your injection therapy, physiotherapy have all been exhausted. Mind me, a bare minimum of nine to 12 months of this therapy should all be, be requisite. That is the reason I have put it twice to emphasize the point. The third one in today's practice of mine would be a case where I had initially gone in for a manipulation under anesthesia and recalcitrant or a failed MUA. Definitely, I, <laughs> it would build more confidence for me if I could go the next time arthroscopically looking at the intra-articular picture step by step and working on it. Now, what is this slide? There's a lot of literature, a lot of diagrams. What I mean to say is as simple. It all talks about the pathogenesis, the phases of frozen shoulder, the idiopathic fibrotic process, how the myofibroblasts, you know, work on this. Now, I'm not here to talk on this too much. I think this would be beyond the scope of this talk. Now, what I would like to emphasize is the time period of intervention. Any operative modality in frozen shoulder 
should be intervened only after the fibrotic process have been burnt out, which means the shoulder has become simply stiff. There is no any chance of thawing of the shoulder or any involvement because mind you, frozen shoulder is always a self-resolving <coughs> process. So we leave the nature to heal. And only when the nature heals in a bad posture, unable to recuperate, we do intervene by some form of operative modality, here being an arthroscopic capsular release. So which is here considered as the phase three or phase four of arthroscopic, I mean, uh, frozen shoulder, stage, th phase, stage three or stage four of frozen shoulder. <clears throat> I love this diagram on the left showing the various anatomical structures that are involved or that goes into stiffness which causes restriction for different shoulder movements. Now why is this important? We all know two important structures that are involved with frozen shoulder being the capsule and the most ligament that has been taught about is the coracohumeral ligament which causes limitation of your external rotation which is the you know earliest movement to hang up with and interestingly it also contracture of the coracohumeral ligament also has a bearing on the internal rotation because of its thickened and chunky radius caught you know uh, hindering internal rotation and some amount of adduction in the plane of shoulder movements now, why this diagram is important? I follow the concept of selective release, especially in non-diabetic frozen shoulder patients. I see a spectrum of people wherein, although the global range of movement is involved, certain movements are too much involved, which means certain part of the capsule and some ligaments are more involved than the other. <laughs> so I do, for example, I see patients presenting to me too much with internal rotation deficit more than anything, or sometimes with external rotation deficit. Especially in those cases, I concentrate in, in internal rotation deficit more on the posterior capsular release rather than the anterior structures. And in these are the cases where I feel the CHL is not predominantly involved, I sometimes tend to avoid releasing the coracohumeral ligament because, mind you, CHL is considered one of the most important ligament of the shoulder, suspensory ligament of the shoulder with its strategic position. But diabetics frozen shoulder entirely differs this algorithm. I go in for an extensive 360 capsular release along with coracoclavicular, I'm sorry, coracohumeral ligament release. Now the picture on the right is the concept by Laurent Lapause, who characterizes the shoulder based on a house. He divides it onto intra-articular component, the subcoracoid, subacromion, and also the axillary components. Now, this helps us to localize the region of release, especially when you're looking at the concept of secondary shoulder stiffness, which is beyond the scope of this talk. MRI, I always look at two clinching features. One is the thickened tissue in the inferior axillary pouch. The other, the tissue thickening or the rotator interval congestion, which I call. Also, I would like to look at any tears that I look, could look at at the rotator cuff, which is important because sometimes they can coexist in making the treatment algorithm a little bit into and individualized or customized the surgeon has to work with. Now let me take you across one of my patients. He is, if I'm right, a 55-year-old gentleman, diabetic, failed conservative management. Of course, diabetes is in somewhat control, but uh, failed conservative management. This was his uh, preoperative shoulder range of movement. You can see the shoulder objection is hardly 30 to 40 degrees in the glenohumeral plane, remaining being a cheat movement that does not take in the glenohumeral joint. Now, I take him to the OR. My classic position of choice in this procedure, I'm more of a beach chair surgeon. I find it very comfortable, very anatomical, 
making the shoulder movement you know uh, very accessible uh, maneuverable for me but mind you always uh, there are people who recommend the lateral decubitus position for this reason being now now there's one more point i would like to stress upon arthroscopic capsular release is not a procedure to be done in the very early part of learning phase for the surgeon who is keen on learning shoulder arthroscopy though it appears technically easy and simple putting the scope or maneuvering the scope inside the joint in a very tight compartment in a contracted tissue is really hard one which needs expertise and it needs and it works well only in the best hands because an inadequate capsular release or inadequate release arthroscopic release fares well or fares i'm sorry does not fare well as compared to a mua so it, you know it is a procedure to be done in a surgeon confident to handle all around the shoulder so what is the picture on the right hope you can see that always i go heard uh, the request my anesthetist to give a pre operative i mean sorry you know pre operative supraclavicular nerve block now that helps me in two things one reduces the local congestion in the shoulder preventing intraoperative bleeding controlling with hemostasis intraop second post operative pain management and early rehab now how do i split up the steps being portal placement quick round of diagnostics starting with the release always start i start from the anterior rotator interval ch ligament release then go for the capsule entire anterior superior antero inferior posterior postero inferior that's how it works for me subacromian decompression let me explain you to you why when it comes to the uh, video of it and last the most important step is the post release shoulder mobilization and also i'll explain to you as we go through the surgical videos now this is the patient's uh, surgical video i am uh, the viewing portal being the posterior portal and i am establishing the anterior portal by the outside and needle technique <laughs> quite uh, an easy one to do work on with now what is the next step going on to anterior lilies again viewing from the posterior portal you can see the thick fluffy tissues on the rotator interval I always love using the underwater cautery or the wand here rather than the shaver because these are tissue flooded with capillary supply usually you know they tend to bleed a lot and they bust <clears throat> so you know uh, using a cautery would uh, help me with the, the uh, vision management as well uh, cleaning up the uh, rotator interval now this is the most important set coracohumeral ligament before i play the video i a quick talk on the anatomy what we need to understand the number of people who have really worked on the coracohumeral ligament now before thinking of knocking the coracohumeral ligament understand it is compared to the iliofemoral ligament of the hip which means it is the most important suspensor ligament of the shoulder being its flexibility and the strategic position and it is described with two bands some people describe it as the anterior band or the posterior band or some people as the y band the moral of the story the attachments as you see here the base of the coracoid on the horizontal limb then there is an anterior scuffing that envelops the covers the rotator interval and then goes and envelops the anterior portion of the supraspinatus and then goes back posterior Go, going as long as the posterior superior part of the greater tuberosity interestingly there is one of the uh, the part or the band of the ch that goes and envelops onto the fascia of the subscapularis you know fulcrumizing the helping in the uh, subscalar uh, subscapularis fulcrumization and its attachment to the what do you call as the coracoid now why do i talk about it because of the release i follow what is called as the three place technique or the three point release for ch ligament it is simple i one is cleaning the rotator interval so now now ch ligament is one ligament you don't visualize it as a ligament it is kind of a thickened capsule that's all so first step is cleaning your rotator interval then erasing the what you call the tissue attachment from the base of the coracoid 
then going on to the superior release uh, on the just near to the anterior part of the supraspinatus and uh, uh, you know a 360 degree envelope release for the subscapularis now this gives me a good clearance for the ch ligament let me play the video you can see here the wand starting with the first step that is uh, you know uh, cleaning up the rotator interval you can start to visualize the coracoid you can see the ligaments attached there this is this is the coracoid here uh, the ch is going to be this way uh, you know nicely uh, we need to bolt the coracoid off yes you can you can you don't observe it as that a cord like structure but it is more of a capsule you see here you see let me pause it for a minute you see the coracoid here i think because of the video editing once it is clear i want to have the coracoid as bold, you know shaved off as osteotomized as this so that we kind of superiorly erase the ch ligament so this is the kind of view i love to have the, the one part of ch cleared from the rotator interval full band and the other cleared from the base of the coracoid attachment now these are two slides that i'm going to talk about two techniques that i do not do is my routine practice now talking about the rotator interval release is is there a different approach now this was brought about by laurent again uh, what is called the extra articular approach where we do not work from the intra articular we go on to the subacromian region through the viewing from the lateral portal and we work from the anterolateral portal doing the release now where do i use this especially where in scenarios where i am expecting too much of uh, you know tissue and stiffness to be happening in the rotator interval region this usually does not happen uh, for primary uh, frozen shoulder usually for secondary shoulders for example uh, prior surgeries in the labral work or something causing stiffness so causing too much of tissue in the uh, rotator interval which gives now extra articular approach gives a more of out of the box view to give an extensive rotator interval release and also ch ch ligament release now this is this is not the video of the case that i showed you this is one other case of mine the viewing is from the uh, lateral portal and my antro working or the underwater cautery is being bought from the anterolateral portal you can see nicely uh, you know the tissues being burred and shaved here you see can see the the knee of the coracoid under surface of the coracoid tissues being cleared well here you can see this is you we are slowly starting to osteotomize the i mean sorry um, skeletonize the coracoid so this is this is the way of doing it releasing the ch slowly starting to do that now then you can also start opening up the rotator interval you can see this is the uh, you know you can observe the long head of biceps this way it is on the upper hand so that's that's a short video just to know there is another technique of that sorry now yeah that's a important question do i always slay my long head of you know long head of biceps yes uh, of course uh, i've been in part of uh, the french soil i have loved to do the slaying part but what is more important to me i do not slay an anatomical structure until it is necessary now what is important you know there are, there are interesting literature and also in my clinical practice when you do a capsular release for an uncontrolled diabetes we observe this kind of unusual lhb adherence pattern to the rotator interval tissue where the long uh, head of the biceps gets adhered and plastered wherein this is the state wherein i love to go for a tenotomy because the, the, these uh, you know they form a conglomerate of adhesion tissues consisting with the long head of biceps so that is when i like to do a kind of 360 degree bicep release i use the technique uh, the technique described by lefos wherein i leave a knob of tissue at the proximal most point of attachment now the concept being even the as the biceps tissue or the long head lhb retracts back it the 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 knob of tissue uh, helps it to stay within the bicepital tunnel and resulting in soft tissue fibrosis kind of mimicking the tenodesis effect let me run the video through this is the posterior viewing portal you can see i have already done an inferior release you can see the tissue you can you can you know see the uh, biceps tissue 
plastered onto the uh, superior roof. That's why we go from the above and do the release. Now that's, that's, that's the kind of release I love to achieve. As I had already described, what that, is, that is the part of the CHL that attaches to the roof, the supraspinatus and the biceps. Now that gets plastered. That is when I want to do the release at IRR as well. Perfect. Okay, let's come back to the uh, business. After doing the rotator interval and CH ligament release, we go for the superior release. Now, I also, superior release is also part of the CHL because as I told you, there is a band of it getting enveloping this anterior portion of the supraspinatus. You can see that we are going above the biceps and then releasing to have this kind of a picture, staying very carefully, not destroying the rotator cuff tissue. That's nice and clear. The most important, again, will be a thickened MGHL. I go release that. Now, along with MGHL is, again, the band of CHL. You know, it's all, this forms the 360 degrees of the subscapularis, starting behind the subscap. The, uh, the top of the subscap is what we did that time, and also in front, which will also contribute to the CHL uh, posterior band release. Now, inferior, this is the antero inferior release. You see that the trick here, I do not use an arthroscopic scissors. I love using the wand. The trick, I always keep the face of the wand towards me or intra-articular so that I do not plunge into the axillary or injuring the uh, vital structures there. Now, posterior release, switch off portals, viewing from the anterior portal, getting the working instrument from the posterior portal, then going for the release, you can see here, let me run the video in uh, need of time. You can see this kind of release. You see the capsule being inflamed and nice. This is what I call the inside out technique or the layered release of the capsule. We don't just plunge in, do a layer step by step till we see the muscle fascia. Let, you show you here. let me show you here. This is the inferior capsular release. So you see here, now let me just pause it here. This is what I called a good layered release. You start from outside, go layer by layer and start visualizing the muscle capsule. Now inferior release, too risky. The, the, the structured fear is the axillary nerve. Now how do we avoid it? Going in a layered fashion inside out and second, always do an inferior release within one centimeter, lying within one centimeter of the labrum so that you don't uh, you know, disturb or you know, come across your axillary nerve. That's the trick of doing it. And come to the inferior release after doing the all the other part of the capsule so you have a lot of space to maneuver around. So that's important. And also a little bit of positioning and fraction on the shoulder will help you. I always like to combine with the subacromineters because what you need to understand, the dis I'm sorry, the disease process is an inflammatory process which also involves the subacromine bursa. So this is the kind of release with a shaver, you know, you can, you know, you need to make the subacromian space clean and you can see there. Yes, yes, this is the kind of release I always love to achieve. Now, what I call the most important step is the post-release shoulder mobilization. Now, you can compare this to tearing a piece of paper. If you look at the best way of tearing, you make multiple small holes on the line of direction you want to tear a paper and then you tear it you have the perfect deadline of paper you know tearing otherwise if you just tear it it's going to go hazy wazy now this is the same what we need to understand we do a layered capsular release step by step step by step and not uh, going till the fascia of the muscle so after the release, once you manipulate the shoulder into extreme motions, so whatever the capsule is still a slightly uh, one or two layers that is uttered is going to have a beautiful release, giving us a very good functional outcome after arthroscopic capsular release. Now, this to me is a very good important step. Now, this is the patient on the first day. You can see here, he has almost regained the entire range of motion. <laughs> You can, you can uh, the, the uh, lesion in side involved was on the left side. It is all almost full, fully involved. Uh, the, I would say the regain of motion is pretty back to normal. 
Now, what is important to do that? One very rigorous rehab protocol starting early, as early as one hour after the surgery. Now, two factors is what we use in the practice to help. One is the supra, you know, nerve blocks that uh, prevent the uh, sensory pattern. So pain-free mobilization is possible. Second is the cryotherapy. These are the two that help us mobilize. And I always tell the patient, physiotherapy and rehab, extremely important, especially in the initial one month of post-op that prevents the capsular readditions to form across. Now, what I call as key to success is patient selection and aggressive rehab in arthroscopic capsular SLAs. Now, what does the journal say? There are multiple comparisons, there are multiple. Now, if you want to be very blind and clear, there are papers, there are literature talking about a small niche difference in the functional outcome of arthroscopic with the MUA. Now, what is important to me as personal perspective, I feel very confident going ahead with an arthroscopic release where I do a systematic layered and a customized release rather than just manipulating the shoulder here and there. I don't know what I'm tearing across and what I'm doing. And number two, with diabetic especially, I can do an extensive intra-articular and a controlled release that could you know, give a good uh, functional outcome and also prevent post-op shoulder instability post-release. Now, every good package comes with something bad in it. What is the thing? As I had already told you, this is an art to be practiced, 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 and it needs some expertise. Why? Because we are going to work on a very compromised shoulder space, which could result in a lot of atrogenic injury, scuffing or bad injuries to the articular cartilage. Also, we have literature, I've seen some cases wherein we end up, uh, uh, you know, putting the troca inside, drilling a hole into the humeral head or the glenoid, which could relent in a very huge catastrophic nightmare for the shoulder surgeon. Now, what is important? Experience is what important. And experience makes it very easy because, truly speaking, manipulation under stenia is going to take five minutes intraoperatively. Uh, uh, experienced arthroscopic release would uh, done by a surgeon who's been doing this in a routine practice is going to cost him another 10 to 15 minutes extra which is not a big course uh, provided the functional outcome and the confidence of rehab that we can instill in the patient thank you thank you once again i always compare the shoulder and like the concept of shoulder crane by greg so it is not always to be shoulder to be looked at shoulder is always to be examined with the upper limb and the kinematic muscles around to arrive at a good pathological diagnosis. Thanks again. Once again, I would like to convey my thanks to the Indian Arthroscopic Society and the people behind for giving me this academic opportunity.